Welcome to Church of Praise online service. We are so happy to have you here with us this morning. Now, before we start our time of praise and worship, let's just quieten our hearts a little and reflect back on the week that we've had, what happened through the week, the good things, the not so good things, and then just pack it up. Thank God for bringing us through all of it. For whether we are on the mountaintop or we're walking through the valleys, we know, we know that our Lord is always with us. And so, wherever we are, we just remember the Lord is with us and let's just rise up and bless His name always. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you Yeah. 
Thank you, Lord. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, all God's children say, Amen. Thank you, Sister Diana Lee and her team for a beautiful time of worship. Shalom everyone and welcome to our service. My name is Shai Naidu and I am your announcer today. We would like to welcome all our online newcomers. We request you to type I am new in the comment section, either on Facebook or YouTube. Now it's offering time. Members can give online via Do It Now, Direct Bank Transfer or Touch and Go as per the information on the screen. Please indicate the purpose of giving, mission, tithes, etc. Non-members should not feel obligated to give as giving is reserved for those who understand what giving means. Giving back a token of what God has first blessed us with. Let's pray. Lord, we give you with joy into your kingdom today. May you bless our offering, bless all cheerful givers. Amen. Our virtual Edurun 2021 is taking place between 1st to 15 December next month. Have you registered? If not, register now at edurun.my. It's a 10km run and you can run in Malaysia or in Singapore to be part of this good cause. Let's run for education with Edurun. I have a piece of exciting news to announce. The reopening of our physical Sunday service on 5th of December. Remember to join us. Small groups foster close relationship and an integrated community. The small group atmosphere is ready made for building friendship. So please be open to sharing within your small group as members let us also be quick to recognize needs and to help meet them. The relationship formed within a small group forms a strong fabric within a church. Pick yours today if you haven't. Next, if you have a prayer request, let us pray with you. Kindly share your prayer request via the QR code or text the mobile number you now see on your screen. All prayer requests will remain private and confidential. Here is a recap on our last week's sermon by Pastor Joshua Young entitled Prepare for Spring in Winter. The part of his message that caught my attention was when he said, What you sow into the ground will eventually surface when it is ripe for harvest. To catch this sermon, you may visit Facebook or YouTube. We have our in house speaker today with us to share her message titled Living the Word in These Times. Let's welcome our sister, So Hee Kin. We thank God the infection numbers have dropped. However, for many of us, COVID-19 is no longer about numbers. COVID-19 infection and death have become personal, where people we know had been infected. Some had passed on and some have lost family members. The elderly have lost their caregivers, young children have lost their parents, families have lost their breadwinner. And there were also recent tragic non-COVID-related deaths that had caused much grief within the Christian community. Whilst in the midst of such darkness, death and grief, when it was so difficult to see a light at the end of the tunnel, the words of Psalm 119 verse 105 spoke to my heart. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Let us pray. Lord, we give you thanks that the situation has improved. The numbers are going down. However, we have witnessed and still witness the devastation the pandemic has caused in Malaysia and globally. Even with the vaccine, we remain vulnerable and fear lingers. We confess, Lord, we do not understand, but we continue to trust in you, acknowledging your sovereignty, your goodness, your love. Help us, Lord, to see beyond the devastation and see restoration. May, Lord, may your word be our guide in these times, bringing assurance and hope, giving us guidance for the journey that lies ahead in a world changed by the pandemic so that we may live our lives to be a witness for you in this wounded and hurting world. Lord, may your word be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My last sermon was entitled, Living Our Prayer in These Times. And the sermon, my sermon today is entitled, Living the Word in These Times. 
The Bible is the Word of God. It is God's chosen medium of self-presentation and revelation to us. And we believe that the Bible alone is the written Word of God, and therefore the supreme authority for Christian faith, life and thought. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13 For this reason we also thank God, without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God which also effectively works in you who believe. And for this reason, you and me, Christians, we have a high view of the Bible. However, this alone is not enough. Having a high view of the Bible, but not reading the Bible regularly and engaging with what God is revealing means having the Bible in our homes, but locking God out of our lives. And come the day we attend church, we read the text for the sermon that day. Then we exit text, the, the church, and the Bible remains a closed book while we go on with our lives. And as time goes on, the Bible will just be one book amongst others in our homes or just one more app in our handphone, playing no part in our lives. But I shall take it that this is not the case with us. So today, let us consider how we read our Bibles so that God's Word will effectively work in us who believe. How do we read the Bible today? Where fear and uncertainty abound and where every other news that comes our way is not good news. Do we read it as a remedy for our fears, as a solution for the problems we face, as a promise that all will be well in the way understood by us? Are we allowing life situations, our needs, our wants, our feelings to be authoritative direction in our daily lives? For God's work, the word to work in us who believe, we must read it formatively, allowing it to have authority over us so that is to read it in such a way that the Bible shapes our view of truth, our values, our interactions with others, so that there is biblical authority over our lives, the practice of which guides us in the way we live our lives in order to live a life in Christ. Lectio Divina, or divine reading, is a traditional monastic practice of scripture reading that treats the Bible not just as a text to be examined, but also the living word of God spoken anew to us. Traditionally, Lectio Divina involves four separate steps. Read, meditate, pray and contemplate to promote communion with God and to increase the knowledge of God's word. Today, we will not go into Lectio Divina. Instead, let us make God's word our diet by eating it which includes some aspects of Lectio Divina. Eugene Peterson, in his book entitled Eat This Book, noted that the most striking metaphor for reading was eating a book. Revelations 10, verses 9 to 10. The Apostle John wrote, So I went to the angel and said to him, Give me the little book. And he said to me, Take and eat it, and it will make your stomach bitter, but it will be as sweet as honey in your mouth. Then I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it and it was as sweet as honey in my mouth. But when I had eaten it, my stomach became bitter. The prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel were also book eaters. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 3, And he said to me, Son of man, feed your belly, and fill your stomach with this scroll that I give to you. So I ate, and it was in my mouth like honey in sweetness. What was unpalatable once eaten, Ezekiel discovers the taste to be sweet. In Ezekiel chapter 2, verse 9, we are told that the content of the message of the scroll consisted of lamentation, moaning, and woe. So the sweetness can only come from Ezekiel's personal and direct encounter with the divine word. Ezekiel was filled, nourished, empowered by the divine word, and embodied the message he proclaims. Ezekiel functioned as a sign of his reality and power. He carried in his own body the word of God. Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 16. Your words were found, and I ate them, and your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart. For I am called by your name, O Lord, God of hosts. Like Ezekiel, Jeremiah accepted the divine instruction once, gladly once they were presented. And God's word once eaten was to Jeremiah a joy and a delight to his heart. If the Bible is to be more than just information about God, it needs to be absorbed it needs to be internalized. Eating the Bible involves taking the words all in, assimilating it thoroughly. It is reading that enters our souls as food enters our stomach and into the inner being of our lives. 
we become what we read as God's words nourish our spiritual life. Under the metaphor of eating, words taken in, tasted, chewed, gnawed, severed, received in unhurried delight and digested have a very different effect on us from words that come to us from the outside, such as propaganda or information. Now, propaganda uses words as a tool attempting to manipulate a person into an action or a belief. Information really uses words to be mere data to be used as we wish. So when we read the Bible as a tool used whether on ourselves or on others, we silence God's voice, reducing God's words as a commodity used to serve our own purposes. We advertise God when we wear t-shirts with Christian or biblical verses, but it is by our lives that the world takes note of the Christian message. Don't be offended. I am not against t-shirts with Bible verses or biblical messages. It is like a walking track. But just remember the message we are declaring so that the word is not just external on our chest or back. Do we take what we're supposed to be relevant biblical verses and apply it to what is happening to ourselves, to someone else, or to a situation? You know, since the pandemic first started, many have come into our lives through Facebook and WhatsApp, using the Bible and claiming to speak for God what He's doing and what He will do. These messages or articles can distract us away from what God is saying in His Word. In this perplexing time, let us hear from God for ourselves. Let us turn back to the Bible and read it for all it's worth, absorbing and internalizing so that the Bible becomes an open book in our hearts and it will be a lamp to our feet and a light to our path during these and for all times. Eating and internalizing God's word even when it is bitter. Ezekiel, Jeremiah and John all lived in the worst of times, Babylonian exile and Roman persecution. For Ezekiel and Jeremiah, caught into a life of courageous suffering, the diet of God's word brought sweetness and joy. In Revelation 10 verses 9 to 10, likewise, when John put the book in his mouth, it tasted good. But when it got to his stomach, he did not feel well. His stomach became bitter, as the angel had said. In difficult times, our reading of the Bible can start out sweet to our taste, bringing relief when we taste the assurances of the promises and blessings of God, appreciating the sound counsel and direction for our lives, recalling memorized verses and finding comfort. However, when we sink our teeth into the Word, chewing it and going deeper, taking the Word into our lives, we suffer indigestions when we find teachings, commands difficult to digest and assimilate into our life and how to live in obedience to them. Then it becomes bitter in our stomachs because we are called to be involved in God's reality, which more often than not does not cater to our immediate needs, wants and feelings, but instead calls us to obedience to matters which we will find most difficult. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 to 45, Jesus says to us, Love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. And in verse 48, Jesus says, Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. C.S. Lewis in his book, An Experiment in Criticism, wrote that we can read a book for our own purposes or we can read it to receive the author's purposes. So when we read the Bible, we are to read to receive God's revelation and to submit ourselves to His ways, to His purposes in our lives, even if it is not what we want or expect so that we can be changed and transformed, even when the situation all around us remains unchanged. We acknowledge God is sovereign, but often our needs, our wants and our feelings are in control. And we use the Bible to serve these needs, wants and feelings. And when things do not change or get even tougher, we try to read the situations of our lives into the Bible to use the text we choose to use it to improve our moods or our lives the way we want it. We are in need of answers, so we open the Bible and not finding a suitable verse, we close the Bible. Then we flip it open again till we get a verse we want or we go scheming page by page through the Bible to find verses that will confirm what we need to do. Or worse, when there are decisions we need to make, 
which we have actually more or less decided, and we just need a Bible verse to confirm our decision, we flip open the Bible. And if it so happens, we read John chapter 13, verse 27, which says, What you are about to do, do it quickly. These were the words Jesus said to Judas. And for us to follow it and not read that verse in its context, we would betray our Lord. When we find it difficult to fit the Bible into our pattern, a way of thinking, understanding and living, do we domesticate God's revelation to fit it into our understanding of the way we would like things to be? Now, God is not a vacuum cleaner to clean up the mess humankind has created in this world. He is not our servant. We are His servants. The Bible is God's revelation and we are not to reduce it to serve our purposes. The Bible makes us participants in the world of God's being and action, but we don't participate on our own terms. God's Word has transformative powers. But only if we dig deep, meditate on the text before us, pray through and contemplate on what it says to us as we allow the text to stimulate, rebuke, prune us. When we eat the Word, we are nourished. Our ways are cleansed when we walk in obedience and we do not end up the same. Transformation takes place. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. How then do we eat the book, as Eugene Peterson puts it? Firstly, Bible reading requires us to approach the words humbly, submitting to God with the intent of obeying and living His word. Reading the Bible is not a skill we exercise with the Bible open before us. The words printed on the pages of the Bible gives witness to the God of creation and salvation, the God of love who became the Word made flesh in Jesus. In some sense, when we enter and absorb the text before us, we are entering into God's presence to listen to what God has to say and is saying to us through His Word. Therefore, when we open our Bibles to read, let us approach with a quiet preparatory heart, with humility, prepared to receive, prepared to submit, and to receive wise guidance, so that our Bible reading will discipline us as we live out our lives as followers of Christ. Secondly, we need to read the Bible with correct understanding. Bible reading with correct understanding and receiving the text will be formative in the way we live our lives. Because the revelation of God does not just make impressions in our minds or feelings, but it fills our lives, guiding and giving us strength in our walk with God in our daily lives. Psalm 119 verse 34, Give me understanding and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Therefore, we need to be focused and attentive when we read. Ask questions. Think through possible meanings, converse with God, seek understanding into what He's saying, allowing God to teach us and we to learn from Him. Psalm 119 verse 33, Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Reading the Bible is intellectual discipline work. And because it is God's word, we need all the care to get it right. Let us not see it as burdensome, but let us, like the psalmist, delight in God's word. Psalm 119 verse 16, I will delight myself in your statutes. I will not forget your word. In these times, when we face a reality where suffering, death, and grief is all around, let us look at the truth of Psalm 119 verse 92. Unless your law had been my delight, I would then have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts, for by them you have given me life. Let us see our Bible reading as an act of love, loving God, enough to want to get to His words right. We are to respect and honour the biblical text by using every means we have to get the words right. It is loving God enough to stop and listen carefully to what He says and give much care in understanding His word. Reading scripture as a connected, coherent whole, we need to know the whole counsel of God, Acts chapter 20, verse 27, and not form our spiritual lives out of a random collection of favourite Bible verses in combination with our individual circumstances or experiences. But this does not mean that we are to rush through the Bible because we want to read it 
we can say that we read the Bible in one year. When we speed read, we are not eating the word. We are not taking time to chew on it. We are not allowing the word to speak to us. Also, a close relationship does, with God does not guarantee correct understanding. Because our understanding can be influenced by current popular teachings, personal preferences and opinions, cultural assumptions, sin, all of which can distort our understanding of the text. Therefore, it is useful to have commentaries for direction and understanding of the text. Eugene Peterson says that he relishes in a commentary not as bare information, but conversation with knowledgeable and experienced friends, probing, observing, questioning the biblical text. Suitable commentaries provide great and indispensable assistance as we read and study the Bible so that we get more nourishment as we dive into the Word. I personally enjoy commentaries. I just don't like the price. They are quite expensive. But then, it is worth it. Thirdly, beyond correct understanding, eating the Word requires meditative, prayerful, contemplative reading of the text. It is a way of reading that brings the union of the entire biblical story and our story. It is reading with the intention to the living, our living of the text. First, meditative reading of the word is a discipline that moves us from just looking at the words of the biblical text to entering into the world of the biblical text. God reveals himself in the Bible as the God who creates, who saves and who blesses, who disciplines and more. All that God has chosen to reveal to us about him is found within the Bible, which clearly then has a context which is huge and comprehensive, but also coherent. Everything is connected. Our living God is revealing himself, and if we are going to get it at all, we must enter into that divine world, and each time we enter, we encounter a new God's word and his world. If we box certain verses into our own understanding to serve our own purposes, then we narrow the wideness of God's word, limiting what it says to us, thereby limiting to what God is doing to and for us through his words. The current trend of prophecies drawn from some biblical verses flooding our phones is from the context of the pandemic and not the context of the word. Meditative reading trains us to read the Bible as a connected, coherent whole. It is rumination, chewing on the word, letting the images and the stories of the entire revelation penetrate our understanding where we enter the place where Moses and Elijah and Jesus converse together. Meditative reading therefore prevents us from reading the Bible in a detached manner. It is not possible. When we involve ourselves into the reading of the Word, it moves us from being critical outsiders to become appreciative insiders. The text is no longer something to be looked at with cool, detached expertise, but something we enter into. Second, Bible reading and prayer go hand in hand. Receiving God's revelation is not just seeing the words in our Bible, it is hearing. Our Bible reading must develop into a hearing of the Word of God. The Bible's printed words are rooted in the context of a personally speaking God and prayerful listening believers. Entering into the world of the biblical text requires participation on our part, meaning response coming in the form of prayer, where we can answer, converse, argue, question and relate to the author. We read and we realise that even as God is speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai and Jesus is preaching on the, the Beatitudes on a hill in Galilee, God is speaking to us and this requires response. The Psalms are the foremost witness to praying participation as we read or listen to God's words. In the Psalms, we read how the psalmist engages God. They argue, they complain, they lament, they even accuse God of abandoning and betraying them. But then they praise and they thank and they sing hallelujahs. How can it be otherwise? The world we live in is not perfect and we are not in control. We can plan our lives but not everything follows our plans. Look at this pandemic. All plans are it's just gone out the window. Our world is not a predictable cause-effect world. When we obey God, we will be blessed all the time. And the wicked will get their justice. It does not happen this way. There's unjust suffering and poverty and abuse, and we cry in pain and indignation. God, why? How can you let this happen? 
but be ready when God answers because his answers come from the context of a world revealed by his words. And God's reality is so different and so much larger than our sin-conditioned world. And coupled with our self-centeredness, we cannot grasp it all at once. That is why we need to pray what we read. Prayer is the way we work our way from our world of self into the self-denying world of God. It is getting rid of self to be aware of God. Reading God's word and prayer day by day, we find ourselves moving step by step into and living in God's reality. It is not easy because God's thoughts and ways are way higher than we can ever think, understand or imagine. Isaiah 55 verses 8 to 9 and Ephesians 3 20. But God does not force us. He commands, he challenges, he rebukes, he judges, he comforts. But we are given space and freedom to enter into conversation with him. The word of God is dialogical. It invites participation. John Calvin says that all right knowledge of God is born of obedience. Our reading of the Bible must bring about participation with what is God is doing and then to live our lives in obedience to His word given to us. Let us not give up or abandon our pursuit of God and His reality found in His word, but let us read and pray what we read in active participation with what God reveals in His word and allow His word to ignite a passion within us and get our feet walking, following the light that shines to where He would lead us to go and to do in this life. For most of us, it takes years and years to transform our ideal or perfect dream world for the reality of a suffering world that nonetheless is infused with God's grace, mercy, sacrifice, love, freedom and joy. In prayer, we come to God as we are. But in praying, we move beyond ourselves to be formed and defined not by the sum total of our experiences, but by the Father, Son and Spirit to whom and by whom we pray. In the ups and downs of our lives, as we look to Him, as we search His words, as we pray, may we see that He has brought us into a broad place because He delights in us. Psalms 18 verse 19, 31 verse 8 and 118 verse 5. Thirdly, when we submit to the biblical revelation, taking it within ourselves and then living it, it is God's word read and heard, meditated and prayed. And it is a life formed by God's revealing word. It is a life lived in contemplation of God's words. Usually, contemplation is taken to mean being still, sitting in silence, sensing God. But Eugene Peterson has a different take on contemplation, which is the view taken here. Contemplation means living what we have read, meditated, prayed in the everyday world. Participation in God's word is participation in our everyday, ordinary world God has placed us in. The here and now, this noisy and demanding world of bosses, families, cooking, cleaning, and we still can find God. Because His Word is in us. Contemplation means submitting to the biblical revelation, taking it within ourselves and then living it naturally. A contemplative life brings together God's revelation and our response, an unselfconscious following of Jesus, just being ourselves, the Christ in us life, accepting and submitting to God's will on earth as it, in, as it is in heaven conditions. The contemplative life is not a special kind of life. It is the Christian life, read and lived. For every word of God revealed and read in the Bible is there to be conceived and born in us. And when we pray, let it be done according to your word like Mary did in Luke chapter 1, verse 38. We mean for the words to take place in our flesh so that Galatians 2.20 becomes a reality. That I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It is Christ in me, the Word, as materially present as the path we walk in life. Your Word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Finally, the written Word serves the living Word, who is Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, the author and finisher of our faith, Hebrews 12, 2, and who is the way and truth and the life, John 14, 6. John's Gospel opens with, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, chapter 1, verse 1. In him was life, and the life was the light of man, chapter 1, verse 9. And John identified the light with Jesus, who says, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life, John 8, verse 12. The word of God likes the way, guides us to the truth, and indwells in us with the life of Jesus Christ. The Bible is the lamp through which the Spirit shines the light of God's word for our feet as we follow Jesus. 
Thus, the Word of God participates in the activity of divine light, casting away the darkness and showing us the way to walk as children of light, Ephesians 5.8. And as we ingest God's Word, though there's much darkness in the world, we have the Lamb within us to light our way. In Luke chapter 24, verses 25 to 27, the risen Christ explains to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus that the things that happened to him in Jerusalem, his suffering and his death on the cross, were all part of God's plan. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Luke 24, verse 27. Jesus' reference encompasses all the writings in the Bible, law, prophecies, history, psalms. They all ultimately point to him. And Jesus makes this point to the two disciples who had become disorientated because they could not understand what had happened to Jesus. His death had dashed all their hopes that he was the one to redeem Israel. Luke chapter 24, verse 21. Today, are we like the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, disorientated because of the pandemic and the effects of it? and wondering whether God cares or whether He has abandoned us. Let us read the word beginning at Moses and all the prophets to the New Testament to know and understand the Bible, the things concerning Jesus that we may learn how to live our lives guided by the light from God's word in these times and for all times in this life that God has given us. The Bible is the lamp that illumines our daily walk but only if we follow its illumination and turn our eyes from the darkness around that has paralyzed our faith, making us directionless in our walk with God. And let the light of God's word to lead us in our Christian walk and faith. The Bible acts, if I may coin the term, as a lighted compass from which we get our bearing when we are disorientated with what is happening, like the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And all the different texts point us to the same direction, Jesus Christ, who is the beginning, the centre and the end of all God's ways. Psalm 37 verse 33, The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. When we eat the word, it is in our hearts, directing us how to live. The Bible does not give us a detailed blueprint on how to act in every situation. Rather, it is a script that directs us in our lives, enabling us to live out the story of Christ, that Galatians 2.20 will become the truth in our lives, that it is really no longer we that live, but Christ who lives in us, and that our lives is congruent with the Word made flesh in Jesus, and every truth becomes a lived truth, lived in our homes, our workplaces, and our nation. That God is a personal presence, alive in our daily lives, where God and life are one in both speech and action that it is in God in whom we live and move and have our being. Acts chapter 17, verse 28. What is written in the Bible is not just about getting people into heaven. It is equally concerned with living well on this earth. A life lived feasting on the word till the day when we will feast at the banqueting table in his presence. Revelations chapter 19, verse 7 to 10. Allow me to close by praying from various verses of Psalms 119. Lord, unless your law had been our delight, we would then have perished in our affliction. Oh, how we love your law. It is, your it is our meditation all the day. Your testimonies are wonderful. Therefore, our souls keep them. The entrance of your words gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. We open our mouths and panted, for we longed for your commandments. Look upon us and be merciful to us, as your custom is towards those who love your name. Direct our steps by your word and let no iniquity have dominion over us. Lord, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path in these times and for all times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Sister Saul, for that great message. The Bible is a book unlike any other, a letter sent to you and me from God, our Heavenly Father. We have come to the end of our service. We hope you have been blessed by today's sermon. Let us now pronounce the benediction together taken from the book of Romans 11, 33, 36. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. For of Him and through Him and to Him and all things to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. 
Dear viewers, like us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube and click the bell to receive notification on our latest content. Have a fruitful week ahead and stay safe. Bye! Thank you.